Hey guys, Semphis here. Just a friendly Canadian reminder to keep forest spying and uh, you're watching Thorin's YouTube. Right, this is going to be another episode of Reflections. My guest for this one is going to be Steele, who is a return guest. Obviously, we did one way, way, way back in the day, right? When we did our last interview was when, in theory, you were still in CSGO, and there was that weird chapter in your career where, like, ESL and the basically everything except the majors unbanned you guys, and you were able to play again. But at the same time, obviously, the actual, like, real ESL button unban, uh, the real major unban has never occurred. Like, I know they did it for VAC people a few years ago, but they've never actually done it in theory for people who were involved with match fixing. So basically, you actually, it's funny, in that interview, I remember people were so hyped. You, you all understood for years, even people acted like that. Yes, all band was like, hey, it's fine, guys, you can all come back now. And the thing that I always found is a bit whack, which is where I want to start was obviously, initially, all of them, except you initially, came back. Like, Dazed made that team. It was a game, Izzy K, Swag. Like, all the people came back. But it feels like most of them. The joke is, you're the only one it feels like actually tried for real to be pro again. Like, the others did it for, what, like a year or something, and then just gradually all quit, right? I think, I mean, like, we all did it, and I think everyone wanted to get back into it. I think where uh, I succeeded where the other guys didn't was that, I guess, like, between, you know, 2015 when we got banned and like late 2017 when we got unbanned so much had changed in life so much had changed with esports so much had changed with cs that it was just like easier for like i had always kind of been there i'd been like full-time streaming i tried competing in other games overwatch i was starting to get like serious with PUBG, so i was already already like still in esports mode i wanted to compete i didn't want to just like go in for money because i was making more money as a streamer streaming cs and doing all that stupid crap than than i was as a player ever and you know it's still true to this day if i had never like quit being a streamer i'd probably be decently successful at it um with how i was but all the times like stopping my stream to to focus on competing i it was like a major driving force for me and i think with the other guys maybe like um irl obligations or just like other talent arising and getting on the same level and then like maybe it was a work ethic i don't know it could be a combination of things it could be like confidence issues from the band and like knowing that we'll never ever be like at the major and is it all worth it at the end maybe those questions were kind of like circling around their heads i, I can't speak for them but i know that i was just there to make whatever i could make out of it because i loved competing what about specifically those two players? Because obviously you played with them when you were in the talk GX lineup, AZK and Swag, right? Do you, were their hearts in it, do you think, when they came in this period? Like, were they putting in good hours and stuff? Were they just trying it out? What was it like? I think they wanted to do it. I think they wanted to be good at it and be successful. Um, I know that, for example, like Brax was really like friends with, with AZK and it was kind of like a package deal. So like when, when we did the split where... Um, you know, three of us, me, Kusta, Poyo, went to Ghost, and then uh, the other two stayed behind. It's because we actually wanted to bench AZK after a string of bad results, uh, the last one being DreamHack open in tours. And Brax was like, uh, yeah, if you guys bench him, I don't want to play. So it's, it was like, okay, well, unlucky. So I think like Brax has a lot of... Um, just like loyalty camaraderie element to it where he wants to play with like super specific people and he'll he feels like he'll excel in those types of environments i guess and then for azk it was um i'm not entirely sure what was going on with him at the time it, it felt like there was some sort of like mental blockage that was really holding him back that he just wasn't able to push through and just like kind of take the reins of, of his own life for whatever reason Right, obviously the talk lineup that we were referring to here was the one that was like pretty up and down. It didn't really accomplish much. But when, the, as you say, when you moved over to the Ghost team with a couple of the other players and built that squad up, that's the one which that one going into chaos is what people probably do remember of your career at the end in CS call it. This was a team that was at a pretty decent level. It could even internationally compete with some of the sort of like lower top 10 teams, etc. Like, do you actually look, are you, are you proud of these teams that you were able to build? Yeah, I think so. And even towards the end of Torque, like we had we had qualified for the ESL One Belo Horizonte event, okay. And then w because we kept three fifths of the roster, we were able to go as as ghost to that event. Um, I I think we, I, I think it is something to look forward to or like look back on and reflect upon and and think, hey, we did a really good job there because, you know, coming back into the game after like a pretty decent hiatus when the games change, all the players have changed. And the talent pool was really restricted. Like, I'm not going to go in and instantly, like, 
the top two or three or four teams in North America at the time are going to be like, well, we already qualify for majors, so what are we going to do with you? I have to go and pick and choose the people that wouldn't be there. And I have to like convince like GMs and org owners and players, like, guys, yes, you could go and play in the qualifier for the major, but like you could also lose that major qualifier, not go to the major, and also lose everything else. Like You could actually go and compete at all these other events except for the major with me. So wh which is it? Do you want to like lose everything not qualify for all these other events not qualify for the major or do you want to have like a chance and i think um i was able to finally like convince like the the ghost gm and then we were able to, to to make a team for them and i think we did a really good job for considering like some of the players i played with before me kind of weren't on the map and then like with me were on the map and then after me kind of like were off the map again so i think you know, me being the common denominator in, in that version of success was something that I can look back on and be like, I know that I was impactful. I know that what I did was an accomplishment because I could see what happened before and after me. And I think there's a lot that some players learned with me. I, I learned a lot about myself as an in-game leader, as a player. Just everything about those experiences on those teams shaped me to be who I am today. And people can meme about like where I am in terms of like results wise uh, this past year, but um, everything about like my in-game leading style, everything about how um, my demeanor with teammates and how like I used to kind of like fight with people and and now I'm just like, you know what I'll you know I'm gonna pick my battles. That type of stuff all stemmed from kind of those learning experiences. So I think that was an important foundation of who I am uh, today. So I, I think it was important as well. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. There's obviously a topic that's a bit more abstract, but we can get into it, right? I would say, actually, you have a problem, Steele, that a lot of people do in esports. It's not as well known for casual fans, right? It's actually something I have a problem with, believe it or not. Like, you've met me in real life. I'm, I'm a pretty chill guy behind the scenes, actually. But believe it or not, it was a, a many, many years, I'm not joking, of me doing events before even some of the people who worked with me, like, sort of knew who I was. Like, they themselves, dude, used to just take, like, the on-camera persona and act like that was just me all the time. And so I'm not joking. I've had people who were, like, worked events like producers who were like scared to come and ask me like a small thing thinking that like I'm gonna like roast them or be rude or something where it's like what the fuck like that I only do that in a very specific context I think your problem is because of the, your personality when you're on stream and that you're a pretty vitriolic guy and also because you're more old school as an IGL the perception of all the old school IGLs is like they're all drill sergeants want tactics done exactly this way I feel like that's been like everyone's just bought that hook line and sink right they probably think that's who you are today right they absolutely do. Like anytime I read comments about that, it's it's just so cringe because people are just like kind of pulling it out of their asses. Like, have you spoken to like okay, exclude like one or two people from like this lineup and then maybe that lineup and ask like the other like twenty people I played with and ask them like, is this true? And at different points in time, different interviews or different parts of, like comes on stream, they've definitely said that. There's something about streaming which brings the absolute like worst out of it. I don't know what it is about streaming, like ranked especially. Like when I was streaming PUBG, I was I was chilling. I actually like enjoyed streaming. Even though I had like way less viewers, I actually enjoyed it because it was I was there on my own time. I only did it because I, I liked doing it. And then when I play like Valorant ranked or even when I played like CS ranked, it was so like I just didn't want to be there. I wasn't learning, I wasn't improving, it wasn't stimulating. And then like on top of all that, I have people coming into Twitch chat saying, like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? It just feels like you're being like nagged by your mother or something. It's like, what am I doing? Like what I, I would rather just like remove myself from that situation. But yeah, I, I feel like <coughs> there are these preconceived perceptions of me from like either uh you know i've streamed like ten thousand hours or more and they have like this five minute or ten minute rage montage from like you know several months it's like okay yeah that's that's me you just pinch and hold me into that so like that's one aspect of it but i i also remember uh i was at the esl1 uh katavita event where you and richard lewis first i guess you guys weren't friends before that and then that whole situation occurred. And then I remember I, I went to the bar, I think Mick was there as well. And it was you and Richard Lewis were basically talking. You guys weren't friends before then. No, no. That's when you guys started your your friendship because yeah, he he basically came and talked to you because you were basically like 
kind of shunned from oh, Pariah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I feel like. I feel like uh, the community is quick to kind of just like pass judgment as people as a whole for a small thing that they they've done either on screen, off screen. It, it could be like one thing that they've said, and it, they could have like all these like you could be in alignment with like ninety nine percent of like everything you say, but like that one thing, um, it's like that that joke with the Scottish farmer. I, I'm not going to say it here, but like um, the one about Shamish, the uh, the goat fucker. Yes. I think so it's a famous one around the world. There's a bunch it's, of that version a, of that joke everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Was. but you fuck one goat. So if you guys want to look up that joke, there you, you can go. do that on your own. So I'm not going to butcher it's it. So true, though. So you are right. Like that's it is to people's mind, right? It sticks to people's minds. So I feel like there's like a massive like aura of that just like hanging around. So anytime like anyone goes anywhere, even with like uh, teammates on T1, people would come into the team for tryouts, and they would be like nervous, like. I've heard all these things. I've heard that he's so like aggressive and he's going to yell at you if you make a mistake and all this stuff. And they play um, like a, the tryouts and they get on the team. And then like a couple of weeks later, they're like, dude, I don't know why people said this about you. Like you're, you're not like that at all. It's like, well, I mean, and it's because I don't come out and say like, Hey, by the way, guys, I'm here to defend myself. <laughs> like it's just cringe to do it. But it's, I think at the point right now where it's like not talking about, it, it's just like even more damaging than, than coming out and just being like, guys, what, what's going on here? Sure. By the way, I want to ask about a couple of those players and those CSGO teams before we go to the Valorant stuff. So one player I want to ask sure. about is, to me, like, actually, this team was the whole reason why maybe even to this day, Coost is a professional player. Like, at that point in his career, a lot of people just bailed on this guy. They thought, like, he was a talent who never made it. In fact, he even had a load of narratives himself following around. Like, he's just a choker. He's a, maybe he's not even, like, to quite out to be pro, all this stuff from years and years earlier. Right? Who was Coaster in this team? Because it feels like this is where he got his career back on track was playing with you. Yeah, I think uh, like he was at a point in time on the enemy roster, like that next best player type of thing. And I think when he went to Liquid, um, and he was kind of like taken out of his element, and he was playing with Simple, and uh, I think he got such confidence <coughs> issues because he was just like, you know, moved around his roles. He lost his identity. He was talked down to. He had like a couple of blunders on stream, and then he had like the community like against him. I think that really did a toll on him, probably. And I, I think people don't understand how big, like, if everyone turns on you, you, like your teammates, your fans, the the whole community, if they all turn on you, it's like most people have a really tough time with that. I've kind of been molded by it. So it's like, a, you know, a different story for me. Like, I'll just get back on and be like, you guys are all dumb. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Shut up. Um, I think what he needed was um a, a proper environment i think he needed someone that kind of like understood him or got him and also someone that like could kind of like jo like understand him as a person his humor his um just like outlook on life and everything like that and i think i was like one of a few rare people that he was kind of able to open up to a little bit about that type of stuff like he didn't tell me about stuff but like i could tell that he was way more into just talking in general with me and i think that was a part of like unlocking him in game as well is that he felt way more confident and comfortable just being himself and and being around you know just that environment and i think people underestimate how big a deal confidence is when it comes to playing in teams and in, in esports and then the other player I really want to ask about, because actually in, in Valorant, like, it's funny. In Valorant, I think his career is the same as CS Go, mate. It's obviously Wardell, isn't it? Like, it's the same fucking story. It's like, he may as well be the same player, mate. I ask everyone, and they tell me the same thing. Oh, yeah, like, really skilled player, but he has, like, one playing style. He's going to just do that one style, and then, like, he just thinks he's really good and probably better than he thinks he is. Like, it's the same bloody narrative around this guy. So give me the angle on him, because, like, I've heard the story, dude. He could have been in, like, Evil Geniuses or something in CS Go. Like, he could have had, like, way bigger career than he has, right? So he was very mechanically skilled. Still is, probably. I just haven't seen him. Um, I think his issue was that he was very stuck in like how he played the game in terms of like his opping style, very slow, like taking that like um, that line, punishing people. Um, if his teammates all died, he just like run away and save. And I remember um, there was like a, a, an instance on Ghost where I was I knew Kusta to be like a very aggressive opper. So I, I had the idea, hey, why don't we have Kusta go and like show Wardell like a few things that he would do with the op? And 
Wardell kind of like took that as like a personal attack. Like I was trying to get Kusta to usurp him as the opera on the team. And that's not what I was trying to do. It's like everyone can learn something from everyone. And as I was growing up and becoming the player I was back then when I was like in my prime and then in my prime again and maybe soon to be in my prime again, I always took things that I thought other players did well and I incorporated it into my own play style. This player did this really aggressive thing that was really cool. I like that. This guy had really good patience and clutches. I like that. This guy was really good with his spacing and his trading. They never got lined up and doubled. I like that. Incorporate all those elements into your own play style, and you'll become a very good, well-rounded player. And if you just do this one thing that you um, are really god tier at, but you can't do these other things, then you're limiting yourself and your value as a player. So one of his issues was that he kind of, if people, if I gave him feedback, I don't know if it, if it came from someone else, maybe it would have been different. But when I gave him feedback, there, he took it as like a personal offense, like I was trying to usurp him or, or um, replace him, because this was probably around the time or after the time that uh, Sabrosa was replaced from the team. And I know that Wardell's like another one of those Brax types of indi individuals where he will do better with his friends and he wants to have like he wants to have his comfort he wants to be at home he wants to be with uh play with his friends if he, he's not friends with you or he doesn't like you he's not gonna you know be as open with you um he did like a lot of like passive aggressive comments with me so i know that there was like that type of element and i'm sure when it came to um kind of like deciding if he's going to go this place or that place. There was that whole situation with like he was going to join Rogue, but then he like at the last minute d decided not to or something like that. Um, I remember like that was a thing. I think he's uncomfortable going out of his comfort zone. I think that's what kind of held him back as uh, as a player, like when he could have moved up to uh, better teams, had different support staff, different environments, and maybe he could have been like a completely different player or, or even person today, you know, had he been more comfortable kind of going away from his nest type of thing. I feel like people maybe don't even remember how good Ghost actually was, dude. Because what I remember was, obviously, look, it's not like you're making like the finals of some huge tournament. But if people look back, people think it's just this team that was like a vanity project for the former band players or whatever. Like, uh, this team used to always, at every tournament, like, pretty sweet, you know the old formats that used to always start with a BO1? Ghost got to be one of the best teams ever at pulling that upset out in the first game and beating some, like, real European team. And then also, if you just look at some of the lands, like, yeah, it's really hard to win, like, a whole best of three against, like, Narvi or something the amount of times you guys were in those positions the way you won the map and then you were in position to upset like it feels like as an upset team this team was really good like what was the strength of this yeah. team and what did it lack i think we were really good with those upsets where we i can start with where we lacked because that that's how we'll figure out why we weren't able to kind of like close out more games so um a lot of uh a lot of it was due to inexperience and when people say like oh this player's inexperienced like why would you want but then like they'll say like why do you want this old washed up recycled player on the team or whatever you can't teach experience you can't teach what it's like to go and qualify for a big event and play against this big team and have a lead on them and be up five versus three like seven rounds in a row or something like that and lose every single one of them because you're playing against you know um guardian in his prime with an op you know and you can't teach that. But what you learn from that experience is you'll never lose in that same fashion again. If you're up, you'll learn how to close out games. If you're up uh, players in a round, you'll know how to like regroup and not throw away the advantage. And that's stuff that like in theory sounds good to people, but like until you get punished by like the best players in the world, you don't know what it's like when you're just playing like an FPL or or in just any like generic ranked against random pubber 101 who has like 140k aim lab score like great they have good mechanics but do they have like good rotations are they gonna punish you when you peek a certain area how is how is there like movement and like everything about it you can't teach that so when we were on ghost we lost a lot of like bad games where we had like good tactics good position good like start around and we just collapsed in the mid round or the clutches the post plant stuff like that and what we started doing is uh, the coach and I, James IRL, would we like started putting together like a handbook, and we started putting in like all these like concepts of when we're in certain situation, this is like 
this is kind of like the protocol of how you want to go about it. So um, for all those five versus three situations, we invented GIB. GIB means guaranteed kill, info, or buddy to trade. So as, as soon as you go up in five versus three, you say GIB. And everyone knows, like, okay, I got an offline here. If this guy fucking jumping no scopes me like simple, unlucky. But like, I've got this kill. Or you have two people playing together, like one's anti-flash or like ready to trade. That's fine as well. Or if you're doing some like really hard to punish, like jump jiggle or something <coughs> over half wall at Inferno or something like that. And they happen to like, like one tap you, unlucky. But for the most part, you're, you're making it as hard as possible to lose that round. Or like another situation is you're playing in or on train and like your teammates are all like, okay, let's do an Ivy push this round on CT side. And then like the inner player is like close lower and he just gets like jumping off and he's just dead instantly. T's all take inner, they plant everything, they have insane post plant positions. You're saving. It's unwinnable. Like you're going to lose that round like 80% of the time. So we just said sus. That's a sus round. Save unwinnable situations. So you start like adding all these very simple keywords. They're like easy to remember. You say sus, you say cock, you say me, think about me. And you you start understanding like, okay, this is like fundamentally how we're going to keep advantages and not throw away leads. And um, that's something that we started developing. And it, it was something that was important for me as well, because I didn't really think about or consider all of those things when I was playing on like I by power or previous, like the game wasn't that level. You could kind of just like get a away with stuff. Maybe European teams, like the top European teams might've had that type of uh, thing implemented. Um, maybe like Sean Garris and that like complexity cloud nine roster kind of had that as well. But I don't like neither myself nor I think maybe days had like an, an idea of like how he wanted to do it, but like it was <coughs> in protocols that you could just like quickly keyword code call and everyone knew what to do. Maybe it was like something that people kind of like knew instinctively, but it wasn't on paper. So that was like a huge stepping stone for me to kind of understand the game better, um, how to IGL better, and how to try to like teach other players that didn't have that experience to be a little bit better and try to like cite examples of that. So yeah, going back to your original question about, um, you know, upsetting teams. Like I remember we're playing against Navi at, uh, it might have been like EPL. We beat it was Energy, Pro League. Yeah. Pro League. We, we beat Energy. We we're like in the top twelve at that point. Energy was like the second first. They were the second best NA team at the time. So that was like a pretty big achievement. Um, we play them. We beat them. I, it might have been like Dust Two first map. We beat them. We played Train second map. We're up like ten five. We're going on to T side. We have them dead to rights on Pest around. We entry them lower in or on Train, and instead of just going into site and planting and playing the post plant, we're doing like this crazy like lurk from Ivy. Wait, wait, guys, just hold, just wait, just wait. He's taking his time. Twenty seconds later, he ends up dying. Doesn't get the kill. Now we have to go in or they've already repositioned. We lose the pistol round and then like we lose out and, and we lose like 16, 14 on train second. I don't remember what the score was, but it was like we had a pretty good lead and we could have closed out or at least like taken pistol but it's up 13-5 and just three more rounds. We lose that. We lose a third map, blah, blah, blah. I feel like that was a big kind of trend with us is that we either upset teams like Vega Squadron when we were at like CS Summit. That might have been Torque though for still, not Ghost. We upset like Navi in a BO1. We beat NRG. Like we beat like good teams, but then we'd go and we'd play like a Dream Hack Open. We would be against like Luminosity, which is one of the Brazilian teams, but not the Fallen. It was like the Yelzao one. Yes. And we'd go and play them. And we'd win map one, we'd be on like map two, Inferno or something like that. We'd be up and we'd be on CT side. And then we'd just like choke. And it's like, that was the story of our lives at that moment was just choking in like when we should be in a position to close it out. If we were more experienced, more calm and had better protocols, we probably could have closed out more games and like actually won, like we could have won that dream hack open. We beat Vitality. The Zaiwu debut, they won that event. They were in the other side of the, we were in one of the side of the semifinals and they were in the other. We'd beat them in the group stage though. And they won the event. We could have won the whole event if we didn't choke that game and we were up. So we we're in a position to, and that was just like, that was the story of Ghost. Why would the, that particular team, like, wasn't that the one where the org just decided one day, like, yeah, like just over, see everyone. Like what happened with that team? Yeah, yeah so... So my perspective on what happened was um, 
Sabrosa said to, I, I don't remember if it was the manager or the GM, that he didn't believe in my system and that that's why he wasn't like, I would say things, I would call for things and he would just like ignore it and just do something else. And he told them in um, like a one-on-one -on -one talk, like that's why <coughs> he, he doesn't like follow my, my lead. And I'm like, we have a player on the team that won't buy into the system. Like I can't IGL a team like that. So we replaced him, and part of the talk was we wanted to have like a, a different culture, like the, a culture of like working hard and grinding and stuff like that. And for everything that Freakazoid talked, we're like, okay, well, I mean, he he would probably be a good fit for the culture. So we we um, dropped some bros and we got Ward um, we got Freakazoid, Freakazoid on the team. Yeah. But um, Wardell was really unhappy with that. Because he didn't know that we were dropping Sabrosa. He was really good friends with Sabrosa. And um, I think he might have had like a broken telephone, something where he thinks that I was like kind of scheming and up to no good and stuff like that. And that's where this whole thing with, hey, you know, Kusa can show you how to like aggressively op on like Mirage and like B hop out this window and kill the guy back site. And I think that's where he really got in his head that I was out to replace him. So what ended up happening a, a couple months after we got Freakazoid and uh, after we dropped Sabrosa was that there was a big, big, big like in-fight team like nuclear meltdown where I was actually benched from the team. Um, and I was benched for without like conversation for like a week. And I was kind of getting the hint of like, okay, I'm gone. Like, I know I'm not getting like a direct message that I'm gone, but I'm gone. And I was in uh, Irvine with Ghost at the time. I had moved to California. Like the whole team was supposed to, but it was just me Neptune and James Arrow, the coach, and then like the GM and the manager. Wardell didn't move out. Sabrosa didn't move out. Kusa didn't move out. Um, so I'm there. I was there with uh, uh, my my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and we just said, "Okay, let's pack up and start driving home." We drove to to California, so we start driving back. And we're doing like the long route. We're going like through Arizona, and then we're like kind of looping back around through like Nevada, and then Utah, and then Colorado. We're taking the long way home, and then we finally we're getting to Colorado, where it's like after Colorado, it's Iowa, Nebraska, it's Nebraska, Iowa, and then you're basically like right back into Toronto. And that's when I get a call like, "Hey, give us another day." Oh, you're what halfway through this was, journey. <laughs> I'm halfway through this journey. Okay. They're like, give us another day. Um, because what had happened was they thought that they could kind of just like go on without me. And I wasn't like an important piece of the puzzle. And then they they almost lost like some like main teams and some qualifiers. And like, this isn't working. They had brought Sabrosa back. And they I don't know who between like Sabrosa or Freakas was IGL. It doesn't matter. They were struggling hard. And I don't know who initiated it. But from the team, they're like, yeah, we, we kind of need steel. So everyone had to fucking suck it up and swallow their pride. Wardell, I'm sure, had to. I had to. I'm just like, well, I could choose right now to say fuck you to them and and go away. Or I could kind of like take the high road, um, suck it up, um, just say, you know what? Fuck it. We have all these issues. I know this person hates me. I know that this this is a huge issue. It's going to like overshadow everything. I'm just going to go and I'm going to man up. I'm going to do this because if I do this, I can prove that even if like things aren't going well, I can prove that I'm going to be professional. I'm going to show up. I'm not going to like abandon uh, any anything I commit to. And I thought that would reflect really well on my character. So I'm just like, okay, I'm gonna I'll, I'll rejoin you guys. And when I rejoined, we we tried to make things work. We we went to all these events. We had like the I buy power uh, invitation. Actually, that happened way before that. That happened in January, and I got benched in February. So. I forget what other events. We had like a CS Summit, I think. And we had like a couple of other events. Which I Dream Hack Tours just, again. Yeah, pro, uh, actually, yeah, we did Dream Hack Tours, but Freakazoid didn't have his uh, passport renewed, so he right. he couldn't get on the flight. So we, we played with the coach, and there was that issue. It was a lot of mess. But basically, at the end of that whole journey, it was time for contract for negotiations. And because three of us signed in June of 2018... When it was time to like renegotiate, we had the one on ones with the the uh, the CEO, and we we're explaining everything. And I said, "Look, like I'm I'm really not happy with like how this went down and how that went down, and how like everything that led up to that point went unnoticed, and how like 
you know, we didn't have like all this hands-on stuff. And, you know, the team manager was like friends with like some of the players and, you know, maybe there was like a conflict of interest there. And like the GM wasn't super aware of like what was going on. And this could have been prevented had we had more like hands-on stuff. Cause when you, esports is going the direction right now of like GMs are kind of like the people that have the oversight and then they install a coach and that coach installs the team and all the players are kind of like on the same level. And at that time in esports, it was kind of this weird thing where you're like, you have a team manager, you have a coach, and you have the GM, but who's got, and you have the IGL, who's got the authority, whose vision is it, who's doing all this stuff. And if it's like, if it's the IGL's vision and everything, what is the coach's authority to, you know, if someone sleeps in or is late or whatever, not watching VODs, can he find them? Or whose job is that? Is it the team manager's job? Does he have the authority to? What if the team manager is friends with these guys? Is that going to happen? It, so what's the GM's responsibility? I think we're at a really weird place in time on that team where nobody knew what was going on with authority and accountability or anything. And that was just like caused like another huge load of issue. So when I was in my exit interview, I, I said like, hey, like something's got to give with like all this stuff. And if that doesn't happen, like I, I just don't want to do this again. And so I, I guess like after the conversations with everyone, they just said, you know what? We don't want to rebuild the roster, so F this, we're out. I don't know. There could have been like other things, like financial things, or um, I, I don't know. I can't speak for like the owners and the CEO and everything because I don't know specifically why. I could just say from my perspective, they probably saw that they couldn't keep the project together, and and so it's like rebuild or just pull out entirely. I, I'll, even though I could probably speculate, I'll ask this question in like a naive interview because it's just better if it works that way, right? It's probably shocking to people when you tell that anecdote that essentially the players were sort of like, that steel guy doesn't really do anything. We don't need him, right? Because the joke is, I'm pretty sure on the outside, actually a lot of people give you a lot of the props for the ghost runs. Like if you look at the lineup, yeah. I'd, I would just say this to the players, like guys, normally if you upset big teams or you're almost beating the best teams in the world, the team liquids and the AGs of the world come and recruit you if you're the stud player doing it. Like, give some guy hard carrying. So the fact that they weren't, it's implied, like the rest of the scene thought, Steve was doing a great job by Jillian. The naive interview question is this, how could players themselves who were involved in that not sort of get it? Like, how could they think you're just like, I don't know. They, they make it sound like the Reddit meme, like you're just going, go here this round, guys. Like, that's all you say or something, you know? <laughs> I, th I think that people don't know I, I think this is true for everybody, not just like esports, that they don't know how good something is until like that's they're in a situation, they kind of like acclimate to it. And then once something's removed, they're like, wait, what? It's kind of like you're you're like living in uh, I, I grew up in Toronto like all my life. And then I now I'm living in like Phoenix, Arizona. So during the summers here it gets 45 Celsius, 115 Fahrenheit. And in Toronto, you know, it's freezing. You have to wear like coats jackets there's ice slush everything during the winter time and the summertime it's like oh you just walk around t-shirt and shorts and you're chilling and here it's like completely different but like once you live like you move from toronto to phoenix and you're like oh my god like it's winter time for everyone's like wearing jackets here why like i'm walking around shorts and t-shirt but you get the summertime here and you're like holy crap like i get me ac but then you spend like a year here and then you're you're just like walking around shorts and t-shirt in the summertime whatever no problem winter time you're like oh my god it's so cold and it's like right. dude like you just came from a place where you know you'd walk around it would be like snowing outside you'd be in shorts and t-shirt for like 15 minutes and you're just be like yeah whatever dude i just got to get to the store Makes so sense. i think yeah i think people just acclimate to things and they think like it's any it's not just one person that's kind of like doing this or or contributing like a large a large factor I know this other person, this person can do what that person's doing, and we, we can kind of hump around, not hump around, but like we can get over the hump by just like being together and having a good environment. And this is what our issue was. Our issue was this player. So if we remove this player, we're going to be like suddenly open field, like just destroying everybody. But they don't realize like as much as like they perceived me to be a problem or a threat or whatever, I was also providing a lot of value that they underestimated. And I feel like this is true for a lot of teams that I've been on is that they'll they'll be like, oh, well, look at his stats. Like we can get someone else that has equivalent stats or whatever. But it's like, what about all the other stuff I do? Like when it comes to creating strats, VOD reviewing, preparing and, and studying other teams, when it comes to 
calms <clears throat> in game? Like, are you going to have other people that are as consistent with calming about like what's happening around the map, about giving ideas, making adjustments? All these little things add up. And I think I do a really good job of like doing a bunch of a lot of things. And I don't think people see the value in all those things because they might boil it down to very simplistic. Can we outshoot the enemy? Yes or no. And if, if the answer is yes, then we should win. And it's like, well, the game doesn't work like that. I remember I, I had a um, an argument with Sabrosa about this, actually, where he, he was arguing that kills are like all that matters. And I was arguing that kills are a means to an end. Like you could win rounds by like killing one or two people. But like if you do like a really good fake and you get the bomb plan and you have like super sick positioning, you're likely to get like win that round more than if you have to just go and straight up like aim duel against like an opper. So I was arguing that like, yes, you eventually need to go and take fights, but controlling like what fight you take, taking this fight out in the open or this player's out in the open, you have a headshot angle is way better than taking a fight where you're out in the open and they have a headshot angle. So controlling where you take the fights, who you're taking the fight on, rifle versus rifle versus, uh, instead of like rifle versus opera, you know, can you add flashes to it? Um, all that is, and positioning rotations, all that players to trade are way more important than just straight up, can you outduel this guy, yes or no? Because what happens if you don't outduel them? You lose the round, you look like an idiot. So I think uh, people undervalue and, and like super simplify how the game actually operates and how teams operate. And then they just kind of been like, well, his stats are like, I mean, for an IGL, they're actually like pretty good. But, you know, for like a, you know, if they're going to compare me to a star player or another star player, if they think, oh, just replace an IGL with like a star, I don't think it works like that. After this, when you then went and you were in that, like, Ben's anime team, which became chaos later, right? This is a period I want to ask about, because I have to say, I thought this was just the end of your career, mate, because that, <laughs> if people don't know, almost none of the players in that Ben's anime team even lasted in chaos. They were pretty much all re replaced immediately by better players. And then everyone's going to remember now that chaos was good, but none of these fucking guys were in it. Like, if you go and look at those names, those are just the people who were just at the permanent, like, purgatory of, like, they're, like, at the bottom of the invite level and, like, slightly be better than the level below and they just stuck around there so like was this like actually like a, a, when you joined that team and then it became chaos was it still the vision of like i'm a pro player and i'm still trying to achieve big things was it just like a stop gap what was the point in why like why is steel's name in this team basically yeah so uh, during the offseason between ghosts and and chaos um i was like looking at different like opportunities for me and there weren't many in north america at the time like Chaos, uh, sorry, um, Ghost kind of pulling out, and then it was just like you had the top teams, Liquid, and then like EG, they were like solidified. And it might have still been energy at that, I don't remember, it doesn't matter. Um, and then there, there's a huge gap after, uh, maybe there's Gen G at the time, I don't fully remember. I think they maybe just like, formed around this time. Yeah, and then this is before Complexity came in. So I'm I'm like talking to different players and seeing like what can we do and seeing like what orgs are available and there aren't really many. And then I, I start speaking to Rush. And Rush is like, hey, I've been talking to these Chaos guys. Like, let's build a team. And during the offseason, I was playing like these random qualifiers where we beat like Team Envy. Oh, Envy was, I guess, a team at the time, like Nifty's Envy. Um, and we had like beaten them with some like random, like, I think it was like Tex and Twice, Typhoon, like, I don't know, like random MDL players with the name, the letter, uh, name starting with the letter T. Um, like we we beat them and I'm like, oh, like there's and Caboose, he was another one. And I'm like, oh, there's like a lot of like talented MDL players that kind of like are on the cusp or the up and up. Maybe I can grab like, you know, a couple of those guys and, you know, with Rush and someone else, we can build a team. And Rush was like, well, I know um, Infinite is like really good. I want to get him and then Hydrex from this Singularity team that was an MDL. He renamed himself to Cam later. I want to get those two guys. So like the, the two guys that I want to get like weren't really an option anymore. So we're like, I'm like, okay, well, you have the connect, you have this, cool, let's do it. A day later, he's like, Josh, I got some bad news. Um, yeah, so the good news is um, they want you as a coach as well, but the bad news is, um, or like they'd be open to me as a coach, but the bad news is um, Complexity has given me a, a pretty good, big offer to right. you know, build a team with them. So so he goes to complexity and I don't I didn't have like an offer to be a coach, but he said I can um 
I spoke to Jason Lake and he said like not as a player but as a coach like he'd be open to having a conversation about that I'm like I'm not ready to hang up the mouse and be a coach yet so I asked like can you can you get me um, like this, this chaos connect, and can we like can we still build that team that you wanted to build just without you? And um, so I was talking to Chaos, and I I had known the the CEO from he used to work at CS Summit, so I met him at one of the original CS Summits, and so I, I started building the team with him, and we we kept Infinite and we kept Hydrex, and we needed two more players, and we were talking about like well we need an MDL spot because you can't just like appear in MDL with a, like a team. So we also got Sheikh Zula from Singularity um, so that we could get the Singularity's MDL spot. And we got uh, Whippy as well because talent was really, really just non-existent at the time. And so we kind of just like made this team kind of like of pieces all over, just like things that you just never would expect. And what I'd learned from Ghost about my in-game leaning style and about just like how kind of younger generation of players are these days is I need to be way more uh, understanding, patient, calm, um, not as like abrasive, not as like, not as much feedback, pick my battles. Like if they have the 10 things to learn, I'm just going to pick like the two or three most important, um, not overload them. Like all these lessons I learned from, um, you know, between Torqued with like um, Poyo and AZK and Brax and, um, Sabros and Wardell and Neptune and all those guys, it was all about I need to chill the fuck out. And so I took like this very kind of um patient, I'm gonna give these guys time. I'm gonna when they are aren't like doing something, I'm gonna give them warnings. I'm gonna be super fucking patient with them because that's what everyone asked for. Why did you cut this player and why did you replace him when why is this a revolving door? Why don't you let players develop? Oh, it was one bad result, it was one bad season. Let these players develop, you need to give them time. So like all this crap that the community says, when you have instincts of like this guy's good enough and this guy can cut it and this guy's not, fuck your instincts. You have to give people time or you're an asshole. So I'm like, okay. So I was giving people way more leniency. And I was like, you know, Infinite had really bad temper problems. He was a really good player. Like this kid this guy, if oh, he I didn't test have checked his out like issues, a motherfucker for this guy. It looked really good, yeah. If he didn't have his personal issues. This guy would literally be in in like a simple Zywu, whatever the current players are conversation. He's actually that good, like unironically. He just he can't get along with anybody. He has meltdowns every day. And if you are not the type of person that's like it's all chill, let's move on, it's just your team scrapped. This guy, I I made it impossible for him to like tell me like fuck you and for like me to cut him i made it impossible he gave me every reason to just be like get the fuck out of here and i didn't give it to him he ended up having to like leaving the team on his own regard and then like to replace him i'm just like well let's what about smuya guys and then like once smuya came in that's when like the domino effect came of like i don't have to be the bad guy because smuya is going to be the bad guy for me so all this stuff about I'm giving Ben time, I'm giving Cam time, I'm giving all these players time. Smuya's in here. He's like, "What the fuck is this? You, you're gone. <laughs> like that's it. Just gone. We just and then we get vanity." If and people then, like, don't know up, the thing about Smuya, this is complicated because he also has his own narratives. It's not that he's just an arsehole. He's just the sort of person, right, Steel? Where it's like he couldn't not say if he thinks someone who's a teammate's fucking up and did it bad or plays, but he just can't not say it. He just has to say it, right? Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had to, if it's on his mind, it's coming out. Yes. It is coming out. He has no filter. He, he, there's no like, for better, or for worse. Like, that's what makes him who he is. And, and to his credit, he like, he can be really, really, really funny. Um, he's in his own regard, like, really hardworking. And he was really talented as well. But, he also comes with like a load of baggage where you need to know how to deal with him. And he doesn't, he couldn't really control himself. So like, you're always destined to kind of like end in a certain outcome. So we started making the changes where first it was like, okay, Tamiya wants to replace Ben. Who are we going to, or I don't know who replaced first. doesn't matter. It might've been Ben. No. Cause they were on the team at the same time. It's like, who are we going to get? Well, there's Moose and there's Vanity. 
and I'd kind of like known both, but I I was like I pushed a little bit for vanity more, and and I think that was like the best decision for the team because Smuya was like thank you for picking vanity, and then I think we started steamrolling, and then that's when we were able to like be like okay. Ben's out. Here's Zeppa, and or uh, I think it was Zeppa first. We got MC as the coaching at at some point in time there early on when we got Smuya as well, and he was also like uh, a driving force be- behind just being like, yeah, I I'm gonna be the bad guy. I'm gonna I'm gonna start replacing people if they're not cut out for it. Uh, Cam was the next to go, and we got Leaf, and then um, and then Leaf had like the thing with like Valorant, and he came back and all this stuff. So I think this the domino effect started when we got Smuya. Then we got MC Vanity. All that started kind of pushing us to the chaos that everyone remembers. But the beginning of it, I was so ingrained in my head from Ghost. I can't be the bad guy here. I need to give people time. I need to let people develop. And I know you can't teach experience. So we're going to have some tough losses. And people are going to have to just deal with that. And uh, I might have been too lenient. I might have been too patient. I might have, I sh- maybe should have been a bit of, more of an asshole and pushed more for things. I, I think that was like another learning experience from it's like I went from like kind of one extreme with ghosts. I wouldn't even think I was an extreme. I, I've seen extreme, but people perceived me as the extreme. So I overcorrected, which is like uh, a trend for me. And like as a player in game, I overcompensate, I overcorrect a lot for like right. teammates not doing this, I'm going to do it. Teammates not doing that, I'm going to do that. We need a VOD review, I'm going to go Just and pick up the slack of this guy's. Yeah, exactly. So I overcorrected when it came to my IGL style between like Ghost and Chaos. That I became way too just like, yeah, if you want to do that, cool. I'm going to give you time, blah, blah, blah. And I think I I was trying to like slowly correct myself back when, when we had the Chaos roster that everyone remembers us for. Everyone had input. Um, everyone was like equal. There wasn't like uh, this weird in people's heads hierarchy of like this person has more authority or whatever. Everyone was kind of like could say anything to anyone. And that reminded me of like the teams that were you were on when you were like coming into the scene in like 2008 to 2014. There's no like GM that's coming breathing down your neck. There's no like manager like it, it's none of that shit. Everyone's equal. Everyone's there because they want to be there. Everyone's working hard. And everyone, anyone can say anything to anyone, and it's all chill. And that is, like, to me, what makes teams the most ideal is if everyone's kind of just, like, an equal and can say anything, and nobody's going to get butt hurt. like, uh, do you want to replace me? Like, nothing's going to happen like that. So I thought that was, like, a really good spot to be in because that's how I remember... I was successful as I was getting into the scene. And then Valorant comes out when, and COVID happens and we were at Flashpoint at the time and Smuya has to go back and he was on HLTV looking at um, different IGLs because maybe he was trying to replace me. Don't know. As in uh, you just saw on his computer he was just looking at players. Like, it wasn't me, but it was someone else. Okay. But yeah, they, they saw it. They saw it. Just like going through the different IGL. He's not the most subtle guy, is he? I know. Come on, <laughs> come on, bro. By the way, so, along those lines, let me ask this question then, because that's obviously sure. the history of people have never met Smuya and they only know him as a player. Like this team especially has to be the biggest example ever, dude, because obviously he was carrying when he was on this team. It looked awesome. Everything was looking like it was clicking. The vibe looked good. Yeah. So essentially the question that not every fan always wants to know is, Smooth, you clearly is good at Counter Strike. So, what is it that puts teams off? Like, what? Because when he left, even you weren't even like sort of like bemoaning that much. You were sort of just like, look, we're not going to be as good, but it doesn't suck entirely, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, he's he's really good, but he comes with a lot of baggage. So you need to know how to handle that baggage, basically. And if you you're if you're not equipped to handle it, then it's like, can we deal with it? And eh, probably not. I think that's what puts him off because he has had the outburst. He has the no filter. He's probably, you know, had a bad interaction with some people. Um, I, I'd assume. And that's what, and then because he's had that kind of um, just thing attached to him where, oh, he's really hard to work with. If no one's out to bat for him on like his positives and to say like, hey, he's like a really good player and he's hard working. And if you do this, you can make it work. If no one's out to bat for him, then it's like going to be super hard for him to actually find people. I think that's why, like, you know, with Thomas, he's like really good friends with Thomas, and I think that's why um, he's able to kind of 
get in and out and get some like success and and find some stuff is because if he's able to have like one or two like friends that will go to bat for him i think it's going to be a, or even play with him i think that makes it way easier for him fair enough but also I, he he's older now he's maybe more mature like i haven't spoken to him in a few sure. years really so so maybe like maybe that those things that i'm describing now don't even exist anymore the other thing Maybe. as well, especially when you run through all those names is, unlike the ghost one, man, the amount of talent that was actually in this Chaos team, like we've seen since has gone on and done other things. It's ridiculous. Like, to, let's just start with Vanity. So the other angle that having Vanity end up helping with is obviously he could stand in when they had to play the RMR stuff, etc. because he himself has now become like a full-fledged IGL, right? He's been, he, if you don't know in Valorant, he's actually quite famous for that. He was doing a great job in Cloud9, right? So well, who is Vanity? Who was he when you were with him in CSGO? So Vanity was uh, in game leading for his previous team, like E United. They had like Moose, and uh, I don't remember who exactly was on that team. But if people remember the clip of me um, winning a clutch and yelling back, "Where's the shit talk now, you fucking pussies?" That's at Vanity's team. Okay. So, so that was like the extent of knowledge that I had of Vanity, and I I just like recently like went back and and looked at uh, an event I played in 2017, just when I got unbanned some like Canadian championship. And I noticed that Vanity was on one of the teams that we just like steamrolled. And he was just like generic noob to me. So um, when we were talking about like getting players and we're like, well, do we want Moose? Do we want Vanity? I, I said to Vanity, like you can join under one condition. You unbind quick switch. This guy was quick switching between knife and guns. Like it was a fidget spinner or something. And he would just like swing around a corner and just get killed because he has his knife out or something. Right. Um, so I think he he was just like younger and inexperienced. His mechanics were like pretty decent, and I think he had like good ideas of the game. I think he his mind was just going like a million miles per hour, and there was just so much going on that he kind of had problems like focusing and, and reining it in. And I think um, I think he had a lot of good ideas. Like on on chaos, I wasn't even like IGLing half the time. Like it was it was like a lot of like one round. John G would be like. Yo, let's do the um, new door rush thing that you know Big did, and we, we like had taken it. We had like dry ran it a bunch of times, and it's like he makes this call. Yeah, I'm the door player. I see this opportunity. We're door rushing, and then the next round, Leaf's like, "Yo, this ramp guy's shit. Let's just rush him down." And it's like, okay, we're going r ramp, and then somebody's like, "Yo, I got an op. Let me work outside." It's like, okay, we're going outside. So that's basically how that team was operating. Um, so it wasn't like I was in game leading and Vanity was co-IGL. It was like everyone was kind of like right. giving stuff. And we had all these ideas because like we all watched like all the matches. We all watched like all the VODs from all the pro teams and all the big events. And MCU was also there. So he was trying to like bring ideas and structure and setups and stuff that he either tried and tested on Triumph with, with his MDL players or whatnot. So we had like all this stuff coming in from you know Samuya from Europe we had MC from his teams as a coach and I and former I, uh, IGL like he was the IGL of the team that was picked up by Dignitas for that EPL season or whatever and then we had me and Vanity so we had so many ideas and we had a pretty healthy balance of just like passing around like who's got the potato or like the talking stick or whatever so yeah I mean Vanity was already an IGL before and then I guess like over time, he's kind of modified how he IGLs, but also all the players that he's played with, both then and since, have all been like individually capable. Like Leaf, he's not gonna like sit there asking for like, hey, what do I do now? Right. You want me to walk down mid and kill five people? Okay, I'll do that now. It's like Leaf's just like, I'm just gonna walk down mid and kill this guy. So I'm better than them. Zep is the same thing. I was like, these guys are shit. I'm just gonna peek them. It's like. When when you have players that are confident that kind of make their own plans and make their own adjustments and kind of like do stuff together, it's so much easier to IGL than if you have to sit there and micromanage like four people and make plans for them. Like, guys, what are they doing in main? Okay, can you go and, and do this thing to, to beat them? And then like you have to sit there and wait for a response and then they have to like be like, okay, I'm doing this now. It's like, oh, you want us to go fast? It's like, guys, come on, just think about it. Like you've been there the last six rounds. You've seen what happens. Do you think going fast is good or bad? Like use your brain and think for a second. So I think one of the the upsides to uh, I think one of the things that makes it easier for Vanity to have success is that he's got like really good players around him as well, and then that makes your life as an IGL always going to be better and easier, and then you're going to look better for it. People thought I was like IGLing on Chaos and doing all this crazy shit and developing these players. Like these players were 
pretty fucking good before before i even played with them and i didn't even scout them like other people got them because they were friends and like we'd seen them in fpl and i had already approached i had already approached picking up zeppa for um for chaos when we we're first building before like before it was like the ben's enemy team shit and he, I don't know. It was a combination of he was like with his friends at the time, and also he had heard like bad things about me and thought that I would right. not be fun to to play with type of thing. So he he was like hesitant, and I'm like, well, if he's not super into it, then I don't even want to like just like pursue this. So I almost picked up Zeppa because I'd seen how good his mechanical skill was in FPL. It's just again preconceived notion. I'm the big bad wolf that's going to come and blow down everyone's houses, and people were put off even doing like a tryout or like even um, thinking about it. So I think one of the things that chaos did for me was that people realized that I wasn't the big bad wolf out to just like destroy everyone's career. How would you explain, by the way, what happened with Zeppa? Because on this particular team, even though the others all had all this different success in Valorant and other games, this is the guy who, as you're saying, the eye test checked out for this player. I thought this guy was going to be... Like, when he joined that Cloud9 team, which is a bit cursed in itself, I thought that might yeah. actually be, like, his path to becoming a top player. It looked really good. Yeah. Um, not really sure. What's what's the question exactly? What do you think happened? Like, like did, did he underwhelm I, in that sense? Did he not develop further? Oh. Like, what do you think happened? Because I thought, do you You're agree? You're talking about like the first iteration of uh, Cloud9 Valorant? No, no, I actually meant the one or, when he did it in CSGO, you know, where he came in at the end to replace like Woxic or whatever before they shut the project down. Like, he actually, yeah, he was on the Henry G Cloud9 briefly. Oh, shit, was he? Yeah. Oh, bad, dude. I'm sorry. I heard no, it's all good. I don't remember. It's all good. Um, so I, th I think when it comes to like projects like this and when like um small things happen where it's like you have like a good player and he's just not in the right environment where like he's not able to be unlocked to his potential i think it could be a number of reasons it could it could have been coaching staff it could have been like what role he was in it could have been in-game leader it could have been so many things that to speculate on that like i i didn't even remember that he was on that team so like that's that's just like a testament to kind of let me I spin it this way then. What about this? That? What what sure. how how should someone have used Zeppa in CSGO to be at his peak? Like what sort of player should he have developed into and could he have been? I think he just needed to be around people that he could have trusted um to kind of like follow him up, um, respect him, and that people that he respected and and uh, liked playing with. I think he needed that for a little bit. And I think he could have been like either entry fragger or like the second guy in. I remember when I was like briefly coaching that CLG roster with Tarek, I'm like, oh, he, he could actually be a really good entry fragger. And he's like, no, I, I want to be second or third guy in. I, I want to play the trades and I want to play the clutches. I think Zeppa kind of could do like a bunch of things because he mechanically he was really good that he could go in entry and be like really successful at kind of opening the rounds up. But I could also see how he'd, he could also be good at being the second one in because your second slash third person in needs to be able to get that trade. You can't let the, the defender go and get the first guy and then the second or third guy as well. He needs to get put down right away. And I, I feel like Zeppa could have been that guy, but it also depends on the, who the other pieces on the team. Like if Zeppa's going in, he knows Leafs behind him. I'm sure he doesn't mind going in first. But if Zeppa's going in and he's got, you know, don't want to name names behind him, he's probably like, y you can go first. So yeah, without knowing who else was on the C9, I I vaguely remember like was floppy on. No, I don't even remember. Yeah, well, briefly, anymore. yeah. Don't worry about yeah. that anyway. That's by the way. Yeah. Like, yeah, what yeah. about, um, so and you mentioned him already, but the guy who actually at the time got no shine on Chaos was obviously MCE, the coach. Because as you yeah. say, the perception was, this is Ghost again, it's just Steel, he's doing it all. And if you're the coach, your job is just go, do you want some water, Steel, or whatever the fuck people imagine coach do. But again, I would just say, if people know anything about Valorant, this guy has been pretty successful in Valorant. Like, a lot of people credited the guard team he was on as being, like, innovative. He's now got himself a gig on Cloud9. Like, who was this guy? It sounds like he's also someone who was sort of like a... a already a talent in CSGO, right? Yeah. MC, I first played with him at some random Fragadelphia where I put together some like random pug roster. And I'd kind of, kind of known him at the time. So I'm just like, yeah, let's play. Um, like he was driving down from Texas. He was going to cast. He's like, yeah, I'll be there if you need a fifth. Like, uh, let me play. I'm like, okay, sure. Like we need one. So that that was my first uh, interaction with him. And he had, he had been like around like top of like premier and, and pro league areas. And he has a really, really, really good mind for the game. And I think his downside as a player was that 
I feel like it was also like in his own head, confidence, nervousness when he comes to matches. So he wouldn't perform that well in matches, but he always had like pretty successful teams. So, um, yeah, as time went on, I had seen him with uh, with that Dignitas core that became Triumph eventually, with like uh, Grim and uh, um, Voltage and like those types of players, and like Exceed. And he turned these people that were just like complete nobodies at the time into like you know potential world beaters. Like these guys were putting on a clinic on like some like the best North American teams at the time. Like they would frequently beat us. And it was all because like he had a really good system for people to to follow that system um, with like good setups and like good reactions. Like you're in here and this is why you're in this position and and your teammates here and he's gonna back you up. So if they're coming here, like all this is like taken care of. So the players just didn't have to really worry about anything. They could just like just focus on killing. He really understood CS and I think he also really understands Valorant. And he was really good at explaining to people why not just like where they have to be but why they have to be there and so on on i mean in mdl like not really many people followed or cared about mdl so people really didn't think about like the coaches at the time and people didn't realize that i feel like a lot of the success was because of mce so when we picked up mce it's like well i mean we had the issue where like everyone was just contributing so his kind of like authority and everything was was a little bit limited but he did come to us and and he picked his battles he's like well there's like these guys are crazy and all over the place and there's like five things that i need to be working on right now but i'm gonna pick this one thing to to drill to them and it's like you know for me it was like we got way too trolly like i would start buying like p90s when we're up like 15 11 against certain teams because that that was like the vibe on the team it's just like we got way too troll when we were up which is pretty bad and people think like i'm this like no you have to be like by the book you have to be super strict and everything like that no like i i troll more than anyone so um yeah so mc was there um with chaos they were pretty successful he had pretty good like value valuation going into like getting picked up by a valorant team he went to gen g he had i think a pretty good idea of like what he wanted but he wasn't in a position to make it happen and i think what ended up happening was he got kind of like screwed over from gen g because they didn't value him or his opinion and so when he took his talents to the guard I think that's when everyone realized, holy shit, this team of like literal ranked nobodies or people that weren't successful in other pro teams that nobody would think would ever qualify for a land in the next like three years minimum, just like upset the best teams, qualify for an international land, what's going on and who's behind it. And I think everyone in Valorant especially looks first to the coaches to see right. is the team good or bad. It's the coach, except for in my situation, they look at me. If, if we're doing good or bad sure. and if we're doing bad it's me and if we're doing good it's the coach or something i don't know <laughs> anyway different different topic so i think everyone realized at that point wait mc is actually really talented and then or like really understanding of the game and knows how to like develop players and, and build a, a system that works and then since then he's you know he's had time to talk publicly and been in interviews and stuff like that and i think people are now being more exposed to him and can see what he can do. And I think the big break was just how small and how little people cared about MDL and CS and just like how little people cared about coaches and did, they just cared too much about stats and individual players. It's like, oh, Grimm's the reason why that team's winning. Yes. It's like, well, what's what's making Grimm so successful? It's, you know, MCEs like here, bite-sized pieces so that Grimm's able to just go and flourish. And people don't understand that until like a team makes it big. And it's like you have to push through this like threshold. And once you're through it, everyone sees you. But before you're through it, people just like they don't even recognize you at all. Like who what MC who? The last player on this team I want to talk about is obviously going to be Leaf, the player you mentioned earlier. The problem is, he, this is where you know people who only know CSGO, because all they know in CSGO is two things. One, he was like 16 years old, which was like the big deal. And then two, he had that whole incident with Fallen and the whole drama of the Brazilians telling him they're going to kill him. Spoiler, get in line, kid. That's just a fucking Monday for me, but whatever. <laughs> right? <laughs> but the big problem is, if people don't know in it's Valorant... It's a measuring contest, okay? All right, like, all right. Sure. I, I get more death threats than you. <laughs> I definitely do, though, but even so... 
No, because, <laughs> okay. but if people don't know, in Valorant, he unironically became one of the absolute best players in the whole world, right? Like, th- yeah. this is a player where I look back and I think if we didn't have the online era, we had the land circuit, we had the natural progression of becoming a top player. If he was in CSGO, he would have become a top player, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think one of uh, the issues with with him was uh, he had some health issues, which made it difficult for him to uh, commit to certain teams or or even like lands. So like there was that big question mark. And I think the COVID era and then like blowing up from there, I think, unironically, might have been really good. I don't. I I've never um, asked him like specifically. I never had the one on one talk. It was always like hearsay, and I don't know like how public. Okay. I know that it is public that he did have some health issues. Um, I just don't want to talk to about the extent of it, but I feel like that might have been unironically really good for his career that, um, you know, between the right people like Vanity vouching for him and, and pushing for him and then like uh, Valorant coming out at the right time and COVID happening at the right time. I think all those things kind of the stars align for him to kind of right. get his shot because like. You could look to all these kids that are like 15, 16, 17 that have like insane mechanics. But what he also had was like, he didn't care that I was like, you know, 30 or whatever the hell old, however old I was at the time. Like he, he would talk to me this, like we were both the same age, whether it's like we're both 16 or we're both 30. Um, he had this kind of like ego but also maturity he was like definitely older um mentally than than his physical age type okay. of thing More mature. So i think okay. yeah so i think like all of these things definitely helped um because he was still like grinding every day he was playing all sorts he was not stop playing but he's also watching vods he's also um, like when he's watching pro matches, he's not just like sitting there, like mindlessly, like listening to the casters. Oh, what a shot! He's like actually talking to other people, like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Like, you know, um, that's such a bad play. Why wouldn't he just go here? Like, thinking about the game when you're actually watching it. So, I think like when you have a group of friends that are all like watching the game and ta- talking about the game together, about like what's happening, what's good, what's bad, um, that's always going to make you a better player. And I think he was surrounded by players like-minded. So like the Zeppas, the Vanities, and then whoever else was in that friend group. Um, I think that also helped his trajectory. By the way, just as an aside, like those clips that all the Brazilians went nuts over, like, bro, these so are the most pedestrian yeah, so clips of all time, right? They're not, they're not even that crazy. I never understood that angle. Like if it was some mad degree, just shit, I'd get it. But these are just like standard clips. There's nothing crazy about them. It's all right. Dude, I still can't get over. Like, people will think he's cheating. I was observing the Katowice major where Flusha, he's on LGB at the time or whatever. Um, and he's like spraying on Lane Inferno. He's spraying at a guy and then like flick one taps mid spray at some other guy and then lo- relocks on the other target. I'm like, you're going to tell me that it's a pretty this, clip. I don't know what this, you're about. this yeah. clip of leaf just like um just like aiming at a wall and a yes. guy runs into his crosshair looks at anything like that and and flush was like cleared as a cheater type of thing like oh no he's chilling like he's not cheating it's just like yep. it was just like a, you know it's like how how inconsistent people are with like this person's a cheater and this one's not and no no way that person's cheating wait that's so suspect it's like you got to be a little bit i don't know it was just really weird that just people just pick on um, well, this guy beat my team and my team's from this region, so fuck you, you're cheating. It's like, eh, really? By the way, I love Brazil. Okay, fair enough. Just an unrelated piece of information. Yeah, okay. I, it's good I, to know. I'm really, completely it's, unrelated, yeah, it's good by to the know. way. It's always good I love to know. Brazil. This video was kindly supported by Ahmed Hadju, Hades Good, Matt Pugnacio Rakula, Animosity, Butt Pounder 420, Jensen Gore, Kovacevic, Ord, Tobias Bernasconi, Tosh, Token and as always, special thanks goes out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my upcoming content? Maybe you want to ask a question in my monthly AMA. Would you like teasers to find out who the guests are for upcoming interviews and shows? Maybe you want to take part in one of those lengthy esports discussions with me that can go all over the place. Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Scaluminati today, where in the description box below, there's a Patreon link.